Well, welcome. Welcome to All Souls. Today is a wonderful day. It's the day we celebrate Palm Sunday, the day that leads us into Holy Week, where we journey with Jesus to the cross and ultimately to his triumphant resurrection. So as we look to the cross, let's start by singing this wonderful hymn, Ride On, Ride On in Majesty. Let's sing. So we come now to a time of confession. You know, confession is a time where we, like David, acknowledge that you, God, you know my folly. My guilt is not hidden from you. You know, sometimes it's just good to come clean, to acknowledge that sin has gotten the better of you this week. So why let shame and guilt and despair cause you to waste away? You were saved to live in freedom. The yoke of slavery is gone. Sin no longer has dominion over you because Jesus defeated its power over your life. Christian, your God is merciful and he is quick to forgive you this morning. Repent and live and he will give you a new heart and a new spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we confess that we have sinned and fallen short of your standard. For we have surrendered our hearts and minds to the enemy by our secret and our known sins. Father, forgive us and heal us. For our sins, Lord Jesus, you died. For our restoration, you rose again. Draw us back to you this holy week that our eyes may catch the vision of your tears and our hearts the wonder of your grace. Help us to see ourselves for what we are, sinners in need of a Savior. By your Holy Spirit, raise us to new life again. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the prophet Micah says, Who is a God like you, who pardons sins and forgives transgressions? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. Glory to God. Christian, if you have confessed your sin, God has forgiven you of your sin because Christ died for your sins. So with hearts free from the weight of sin, let's continue to sing of our wonderful Savior who leaves the 99 for the one who strayed. What once was lost is now found. Let's sing.
so he could say, What once was lost is found. Raise up the joyful sound. Come now and celebrate. This one is home and safe. What once was lost is found. It's time to jump around. Let's have the To see the one she couldn't find And when at last a coin appeared She wanted everyone to hear What once was lost is found Raise up the joyful sounds Come now and celebrate This one is home and safe What once was lost is found It's time to jump himself with pigs and mud He came back sure that he had been disowned Though he was sad for what he'd done But as in shame he hung his head His father ran to him and said What once was lost is found Raise up a joyful sound Come now and celebrate This one is home what once was lost is found It's time to jump around Let happiness abound For the loss is found Every day it's happening The loss are found by the loving king And as they turn from all their sin Listen Time for some family news, and here are a few dates for your diary. On the 14th of April, instead of our usual Monday, Thursday service, Artless Theater will be performing The Centurion right here at All Souls. Centurion follows the Easter story through the eyes of a Roman soldier who must choose between hope and forgiveness. This promises to be a really good production. Tickets are selling quickly, so if you want to see this new take on the Passion Play, which offers a fresh perspective on the Easter story, then do visit the link below. Prom Praise is back at the Royal Albert Hall. I, for one, am really excited as this is one of my greatest memories of being here in London, was right here at the Royal Albert Hall for Prom Praise. This is probably one of the best Easter concerts you will see this year or even ever. So do join us in person or online. Uh, you can even invite your friends and your family. Uh, the Gettys will be there along with a few other special guest artists. So remember the date, May 14th. And to find out more information, do see the link below. And finally, we are so thankful for all you who support the work and ministry of All Souls. And if you would like to give, you can also see the link below. Your contributions allows us to proclaim this wonderful gospel all around the world. And as we like to remind ourselves each week that all things come from you, O Lord, and of your own do we give you. Let's continue now in prayer. Father, your word tells us not to be anxious about anything, but in everything, with prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving, present your request to God. We come before you now, almighty God, with our requests, confident 
that you do hear us. We bring before you the needs of our world. and More specifically, we pray for this ongoing conflict in Ukraine. We pray that you would bring about a speedy resolution to this conflict. Dear God, we pray that you would touch hearts and minds, touch those who are in power and who want to see an end to this senseless war. Father, we pray for the families of those forced to leave Ukraine. We pray for your protection over their lives on their journey to safety. I also want to pray for those who have chosen to remain in the country, but they are now starving. They're hungry due to the ongoing blockades. I pray for humanitarian aid to reach them safely. We pray that, God, they would know your provisions, Lord, during this time of crisis. And, Father, I also want to pray for those suffering persecution in Yemen. We pray that you would strengthen the church, strengthen them, God, and, and help them to remain bold in the face of opposition. May the joy of seeing Jesus one day face to face sustain them when they face danger, when they face imprisonment, and even death. I thank you for those who are standing firm in their faith, and I pray that, God, you will continue to embolden them and help them to live courageously as they witness for you. Lord, may we as a church here in the West learn something of their courage and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, Lord, we just pray for Chris Wright as he comes to bring us your word this morning. May our hearts and minds be ready to receive all that you have for us on today. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We are now going to say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
Hello. The reading today is from Luke chapter 24, reading from verses 13 to 35. That's Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. And I'll be reading from the New International Version. And we're picking up the text after Jesus has risen from the dead. That's where we are in Luke. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognising him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognised him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognised by them when he broke the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Today is Palm Sunday. So we should really have been reading that story in Luke chapter 19 about how Jesus rode a donkey into Jerusalem. Now that was exactly one week before what we've just read about in Luke 24. And that, of course, was a moment of great hope and joy and celebration as they welcomed Jesus and cheered him on his way into Jerusalem. And they were welcoming not just Jesus as a prophet, but as their true king. And that, that he was the king, is clear from two things. First, that Jesus was deliberately acting out a prophecy from the book of Zechariah, that God himself would come as king, but in a surprisingly humble way. Here's what Zechariah says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, but lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 
And secondly, the people seemed to recognize that this was what was happening, since Luke records that they were praising God and shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. But five days later, this king that they had welcomed and cheered in Jerusalem faced trial before Jewish and Roman courts. He'd been unjustly condemned to death and then flogged and executed by crucifixion and finally laid out stone dead in a sealed and guarded tomb. So the Messiah, they thought, their king, they thought, had hung from a cursed cross with words that were mockingly scrawled above his head, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, <laughs> as if. So all the hopes and expectation of last Sunday, Palm Sunday, had been dashed to pieces by Friday. And that's actually our first point this morning. First of three, and the third will be a lot shorter. That is, that the hopes of Israel were dashed at the cross, apparently in verses 13 to 24. Because that's exactly where we find these two people on the road to Emmaus as we join our story. One of them is called Cleopas. You see, Luke likes to name his sources. Well, we don't know uh, if the other one was just a friend or possibly even his wife, if this is the same Cleopas who's mentioned by John, whose wife was Mary, and she was there at the cross with Jesus along with uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus. And they had been with that group of Jesus' followers when the women came in with their story about the empty tomb and the angels. Do you remember chapter 24, verses 1 to 12 that we were looking at last week? But it was all so confusing, so distressing, so basically unbelievable that this couple just decided to go home that afternoon. Two or three hours' walk, it was back to Emmaus. And then Jesus... Jesus catches up with them, and he walks along beside them. But for the moment, God didn't let them recognize who he was. And then this stranger asks a, you know, an innocent question. What are you two talking about so earnestly? Which gets a very surprised response. I mean, who is this guy? Where has he been all weekend? Doesn't he know what's just happened in Jerusalem? And then I love the comic irony of Jesus' reply. I mean, this is Jesus, remember, who had been flogged and beaten and spat on and nailed to a cross and then taken down dead and raised again to life that very morning. And he says, what things? <laughs> it's really quite amazing. Here is Jesus. What's been happening in Jerusalem? So they make their big speech. There it is in verses 19 to 24. Well, it's all about Jesus of Nazareth, they say, this powerful prophet. Well, mind you, not that they had remembered or believed his words, those three times that he had talked about his death and resurrection in Jerusalem. But they say he was condemned as a false prophet by the religious authorities, and he was put to death. And, you know, they, they're the experts in the Scripture and the law and all of that, so maybe they were right. Maybe he was a false Messiah. I mean, there'd been plenty of those before, but really? I mean, just, just think of his amazing life and his teaching and all his miracles. And we had hoped, they say, we had hoped that he really was the one, the one who was going to come and redeem Israel. We were so sure. We really believed that he was God's Messiah. And we cheered him into the city as our true king just last Sunday. But now that he's dead, crucified even, how can he be? No, all... All that we were hoping for is just dashed to the ground. But here's a question. What did they mean about redeeming Israel there verse, in verse 21? Well, actually, much the same as Joseph of Arimathea, who, what he was hoping for, I don't know, did you notice what Luke tells us about Joseph back in chapter 23, verse 51, if you can see it there? Luke tells us that he was waiting for the kingdom of God. The redemption of Israel, the kingdom of God, they were like two sides of the same coin for people in Jesus' day. It's what they were longing for. It's what they were hoping for. And not only that, it's actually what God had promised. And 
It's what Luke has told us all about right from the very beginning of his gospel, that that is what God was now fulfilling. It's not very long ago, is it, since Christmas? And you remember but back then we were reading those early chapters of Luke's gospel, especially chapter 1. And remember what the angel Gabriel said to Mary about the son that she was going to give birth to? He said, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever, and his kingdom will never end. In other words, the reign of God is coming through the son of King David. And you remember what Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, said, that this is what God was doing now in fulfillment of his promises. He says, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago. And yes, indeed, that's exactly what God had said through the prophets. You see, these people, they knew their Bibles far better than most of us do. They fed on the Scriptures. And they knew that God had promised to restore Israel, to establish his reign over all the nations, and basically to put the whole world to rights. And then, then there would be justice and salvation and peace through all of God's creation. And that kind of thinking, that's all over the Old Testament. But listen to just two typical promises that they knew so well. Here's Isaiah, for example, encouraging the Jewish exiles to believe in God's victory for Israel and for all nations. How beautiful, he says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, and who proclaim salvation and say to Zion, your God reigns. So burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people and has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. And here is God himself telling Israel about his plans for all the nations. He says to Israel, listen to me, my people, hear me, my nation. Instruction will go out from me, and my justice will be a light to the nations. My righteousness draws near speedily, my salvation is on the way, and my arm will bring justice to the nations. Now, we could multiply texts like that a dozen times. So you see, from their scriptures, the people of Israel believed that the God of Israel, the only true God, the creator of the world and the sovereign over all the nations on it, that he would keep his promise to Abraham, and through his descendants, the people of Israel, all nations on earth would be blessed. But first, Israel themselves needed to repent and be redeemed and restored, and then then the nations would be gathered in. You see, that's the big story. That was God's plan, as the Scriptures said again and again. That's what they were hoping for, longing for, all through Luke's Gospel. Zechariah, Simeon, Anna, John the Baptist, Joseph of Arimathea, and these two disillusioned disciples that were walking home to Emmaus. See, they were not just wanting a personal Savior for themselves, you know, to forgive their sin and take them to heaven. They wanted God's kingdom, God's salvation, God's justice and peace to embrace all nations on the earth. And you see, they were entirely right to long for that redemption and that kingdom of God, since that's what the Bible talks about. Now, they were mistaken in the way that they imagined it would all happen. Because probably they were expecting that their Messiah, King Jesus, would drive out the Romans and redeem Israel as a victorious military conqueror. But as Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, or my followers would fight. By which he didn't mean that his kingdom was just a purely spiritual matter of personal faith. Rather, what he meant was that his kingdom, the kingdom of God, would not behave like the kingdoms of this world, and especially like the Roman Empire. So that then, you see, was the hope of Israel. That was the story they were living in, the story of God 
the living God, the God of Adam and Eve and Noah and Abraham and Moses and David and the prophets and the God of Jesus of Nazareth, who they thought as the Messiah was going to bring this whole story of the Scriptures to its glorious climax until the day before yesterday, the day that their hopes died, at least their hopes in Jesus. We had hoped, they say, that he was the one who would redeem Israel, but no, apparently not. Last week, you may remember, in verses 1 to 12, we saw that the resurrection is nonsense unless and until you see it in the light of the whole Bible story where it makes perfect sense. And today, we see that the cross was a disaster unless and until you set it in the light of the plan of God himself where it takes central place. And that leads us to our next point. We've seen, first of all, that the hopes of Israel were dashed at the cross, apparently, but only apparently, because, secondly, the plan of God led to the cross, inevitably. Can you see that there in verses 25 to 27? Where Jesus' answer to these two is a, a kind of a mild rebuke, isn't it? for their partial reading of the Scripture. See, because it wasn't that they didn't believe the prophets. Of course they did. Absolutely they did. That's why they were so disappointed. But they hadn't taken in, says Jesus, all that the prophets have spoken. That word all there in verse 25 is emphatic. And so Jesus embarks then on basically an Old Testament lecture. Maybe I can make a small personal note at this point because I've been an Old Testament teacher most of my professional life, and it's a great encouragement to me that Jesus spent so much of that first day of his risen life explaining the Old Testament, twice, all afternoon on the way to Emmaus, and then all evening back with the other disciples. So, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, we read in verse 27. Now, those were the first two sections of the Hebrew Scriptures, as we call the Old Testament. The law, or the Torah, Moses, which means Genesis to Deuteronomy, and then the prophets, which in the Hebrew Scriptures includes Joshua to Kings, the history books, and then also Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the book of the Twelve Minor Prophets from Hosea to Malachi. And then the third section was called the writings, especially the Psalms which Luke refers to in verse 44. And Jesus explains, you see, how every section of the canon of the Old Testament Scripture not only points to himself, but does so in a way that shows what verse 26 says, that the Messiah had to suffer first and then enter his glory. These disciples, what, they had not taken on board all that the prophets had spoken. They'd got the bit about God redeeming his people, but not what that would cost, what it would cost God himself to do so. For you see, the very word redeem and redemption imply a cost, don't they? Something has to be paid in order to get back to redeem what's been lost or to liberate, redeem someone who's been enslaved. Redemption costs. So when God says to Israel, I am the Lord, your Redeemer, he meant that he was ready to pay whatever it would cost to do whatever it takes to save them. And when you extend that from not just Israel, but to all humanity, then the cost of our redemption becomes infinite. You see, the Old Testament shows how the sin and rebellion of the human race are just so enormous, so deep and ingrained, so poisoning of every aspect of life and so destructive of ourselves and of the earth itself, so, so utterly insoluble by any human ingenuity or ability. We can't do anything about our sin. And so our sin cannot be remedied except by God himself. So if the world is to be put to rights, then 
God must deal with that sin and rebellion and evil and deal with it in perfect justice and judgment and destroy and eliminate it from his universe altogether. And you see, that meant one of two things. Either he could inflict the whole weight of his judgment onto humanity itself, and make us bear the full cost of our sin and its consequences, which would mean basically cosmic death for all creation. Or God could bear all the weight of sin in God's own self, carry the load, pay the cost, suffer the judgment, and absorb the consequences in himself. And that is what God chose. Before even the world was created, God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit chose to bear the cost of our sin. God, the judge, would become God, the judged, in our place, would suffer the condemnation of our guilt. And you see, here's the point, that that divine choice that was made for us and for our salvation, that plan of God led ultimately and inevitably to the crucifixion of Christ, where God himself, in the person of God the Son, bore our sin, paid the cost of our redemption, or as Jesus put it, the Messiah had to suffer these things. Fleming Rutledge is an American Anglican theologian who has written an outstanding major book called The Crucifixion, Understanding the Death of Jesus Christ. And here's what she says about this. She's talking at this point particularly about violence and injustice as one of the marks of human sin. And she says, if God is to exclude violence and injustice from his coming kingdom, then something has to be done about violence and injustice and every other form of enmity that seeks to thwart God's purposes. These things are manifestations of the reign of sin and death, and they cannot be overlooked or ignored. So in the crucifixion and its vindication in the resurrection, we see how every power that wars against God has been and will be overcome and ultimately annihilated. Jesus Christ absorbs into himself the divine sentence against sin and death. So when Paul says that God made him to be sin, he means that in the tormented, crucified body of the Son, the entire universe and sin and every kind of evil are concentrated and judged, not just forgiven, but definitively finally and permanently judged and separated from God and his creation. And you see, as Jesus explained to that couple on the road to Emmaus, the scriptures of the Old Testament point towards this in a number of ways. When God introduced himself in the book of Exodus as, quotes, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, that word forgiving in Hebrew basically means to bear, to carry. God would have a lot of carrying to do for the sins and rebellion of Israel for generations. So much so that he could say to them later through the prophet Isaiah, you, you Israelites, you have burdened me with your sins and wearied me with your offenses. He's been carrying them all this time. But then he goes on, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sin no more. And the reason that God could blot out their sins and remember them no more was precisely because he chose to carry them as his own burden all the way to the cross, where, as Peter puts it, Christ himself bore our sins in his own body on the cross. And Isaiah had pointed to that as well. I think this, from Isaiah 53, must surely have been one of the scriptures that Jesus shared with that 
couple on the way to Emmaus. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God and stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, and the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Oh yes, says Jesus, that's what just happened in Jerusalem last Friday. Don't you see? The Messiah had to suffer. It was all in the plan, the plan of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because as Paul will later put it, God, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. But then Jesus didn't stop there, did he? He said the Messiah had to suffer and enter his glory, the glory of his resurrection and his ascension, and then that mission of his people to all the nations that would follow. And so those same prophecies that spoke about the suffering of God, the suffering of Messiah, also speak about his victory. Even, even the psalm that you remember was on the lips of Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The first verse of Psalm 22. Later in the psalm goes on to celebrate that all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations will bow down before him for dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules, he reigns over the nation, the kingdom of God. You see, the hope of Israel was not dashed at the cross. Rather, it was through the cross and resurrection of Messiah Jesus that God accomplished his plan for the redemption of Israel and ultimately for the blessing of the reign of God over all nations and all creation. And all that the scriptures had promised in that grand sweep of the Bible story has now come true at Calvary and the empty tomb and will be completed when Christ returns in glory, the glory of God and the glory of the new creation. And you see, that's, that's why we need the whole Bible to appreciate the whole gospel, including the Bible of Jesus himself and his disciples, what we now call the Old Testament. Because the gospel, you see, is, is not only about our personal salvation, although of course it is, thank God, but it's about the God's great plan for all the nations and for all things in heaven and on earth over which Jesus Christ is Lord. And so that brings us to the beautiful ending of the story. As Jesus, the guest in their home, becomes Jesus, the host at their table, takes bread in his hands, breaks it, gives it to them, and they recognize him at last. What a moment that was. And it gives us our last point. We've seen, haven't we, first of all, that the hope of Israel was dashed at the cross, but only apparently because the plan of God led to the cross inevitably. And now we see that the hands of Christ bear the marks of the cross eternally in verses 28 to 35. For that is surely where Luke wants us now to focus our gaze. Can you see it? As in a sense, the camera lens kind of zooms in on those hands. These were the hands that flung stars into space to cruel nails surrendered, as Graham Kendrick's wonderful song puts it. These were the hands that three nights earlier at the Passover meal had broken bread with the words, this is my body which is given for you. Now, Cleopas and his companion were not there on that night, but they would probably have seen those same hands take a few loaves of bread and multiply them as only the creator of the world could do to feed 5,000 people. And now they saw those hands and wrists with the piercing scars of the nail that had spiked them to the cross. Jesus, Jesus, the crucified Jesus, now raised to life 
been walking and talking with them for the last few hours. Now, just across the table from them, serving them supper. So what do those nail-pierced hands mean? Well, just three things as we close. First, it means that he was the real Jesus. This was not some ghostly hallucination. This was the Jesus they had known, the Jesus they had seen crucified. And now he is bodily raised from the dead with his body visibly recognizable as that same Jesus. And that's part of Luke's point in this chapter. And secondly, it means, you see, that this, the resurrection body of Jesus, which has already entered into the whole new dimension of life in the new creation, indeed, we're told that his risen body is the first fruits, the prototype of that new creation. This resurrection body of Jesus carries the evidence of what was done to his earthly body in that historical moment in this creation when he was crucified. And thirdly, therefore, it means that what Christ achieved on the cross, which is evidenced by those scars, avails, is effective, stands for all eternity. In the book of Revelation, John sees the risen Christ as the Lamb who was slain. It is the crucified Christ who reigns forever on the throne of God. And so the Messiah has indeed entered his glory, bearing the scars of the cross, which is indeed his glory, the glory of the salvation he accomplished there for us, and for which we shall thank him and praise him for all eternity. Amen. What a great word this morning. Let me end now with a blessing. Father, we thank you for your word this morning, your word which is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. 
We thank you for the written word that all the prophets and that what all the prophets have said about Jesus has come to pass. Help us to believe that you are the God who keeps his promises. And that no matter how many broken promises we've experienced in our lives, your promises to us are always yes and amen in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Father, that you will fulfill your purposes and your plans for our lives. And we praise you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.